It's been quite a while since I've done a post-processing video here on YouTube. So today I want to share with you guys my workflow that I used for this image of Horseshoe Bend. I actually took this earlier this year when I was out with uh, a good friend of mine. We were doing a private workshop together and we were able to get out here around sunset, stayed out for the Milky Way. This is actually the winter Milky Way in the background there with the zodiacal light, which is really the first time I've captured it. And this is going to be a pretty fun workflow. So we got a lot to cover. Just as a side note though, if you're thinking about doing some workshops in 2020, my schedule is now live over on my website. So you can go and see if anything looks good to you. I will be out of Kanab, Utah for most of 2020, which has just an unbelievable amount of incredible locations. So be sure to check those out if you're interested in joining me. But let's continue on with the workflow. So the first thing you want to do is load up Adobe Bridge. You can also use Lightroom if you want, uh, but I prefer Bridge for a variety of reasons. Once you're in Adobe Bridge, we can just hit Control or Command A once we found our photos. And in this case, I'm just selecting my sky and my foreground photos. I'm not going through everything. Uh, I've just handpicked the photos that I know we'll probably use. Then I can right click on any one of them once they're all selected and hit Open in Camera Raw. And if you're in Lightroom, you can pretty much use the Develop tab and go through as you're used to. But here are our photos. Now this was here just kind of a test photo to see where I was aimed up at. This was F28 15 seconds ISO 12800, which are my normal settings for my test shots. So I was moving things around trying to get it where I'm just photographing the sky. Once I had it figured out, which looks like right about here, I turned on my star tracker. And then that, that allowed me to take a four minute long photo at ISO 400. And it looks darker, but as I increase the exposure and also bring down some of those highlights, it looks just fine. And if I were to zoom in, there's a bit of hot pixels and things there. And uh, overall, this image is going to be quite a bit cleaner than a 10 or 15 or even 30 second photo. You can see how much more grainy it is. And that's something we're going to cover in my workshops is that if you use a star tracker to take much longer exposures, you're going to get a lot more light. And that's really important for your foregrounds, especially. Uh, so we're going to cover all that and explain why you should use a tracker or sometimes where it's better not to use one. Uh, but in this case, this is my sky shot. You'll notice there's no real foreground here because if I include a foreground, it's just going to blur out anyway. So why would I even bother putting it in there? And then once we had our tracked exposures for the sky, we hiked down to the overlook and then we started taking our test photos again for the foreground. So I moved things around, tried to get it until I found a good composition. Looks like right about here. I like that composition there. And then I took, in this case, a 300 second exposure. And the reason I'm taking such long photos is because when we increase the exposure, look how clean that looks. And if we compare that to a 30 second exposure, see how grainy that is. And there's even some purple glow there. And it just looks pretty ugly. If we compare that with a 15 second exposure, now you're really starting to see that purple glow. And this is the way I used to do things back in the day. I would take a single exposure, the, star, the stars would be sharp, the foreground would be sharp, and that'd be it. That's kind of the way a lot of people tell you to do it online. But again, as you'll learn, if you get one of my courses or if you join me for a workshop, we're going to do things a little bit differently. It's going to allow us to capture much higher quality images. So again, this was 300 seconds compared to 30 seconds or whatever you normally do. And then once I have my foreground photo here, I'm just going to increase the brightness or the exposure slider until it looks reasonably good. I also want to keep an eye on the sky that was not getting blown out. And that brings me to another point. The stars have blurred out, which is to be expected uh, if we're shooting for such a long exposure. And that's where that star tracker comes in handy. So now that I have my foreground exposure, I can go back and grab my tracked exposure from the sky and blend the two together. And that's something we're going to cover in today's workflow. And then by the end, we should have a really amazing final image like this. So anyway, getting back to the actual workflow, the first thing I normally do if I need to is increase the exposure until I can see some of the nicer details there in the foreground. I might bring down the highlights a little bit, increase the saturation all the way. And the reason I'm increasing the saturation is just so I can see the colors better. Now that I've increased the saturation, I can very easily adjust the temperature 
and the tint until it looks correct. So maybe right about there. That looks pretty natural to my eye. The rocks weren't overly orange. And then once I have the colors looking good at a very high saturation, I'll just bring it back down to a small amount. Because remember at night, especially in raw, our photos are desaturated. So they do need a little bit of saturation there. I think that looks really good to start off with. You can also mess around with the shadows and you can see that has a really big impact on this particular image and the highlights or the whites. In this case, I'm just gonna leave the whites where they're at. And then finally the blacks, uh, I'm just gonna leave those where they're at as well. Now, if we zoom in here, again, there's a little bit of grain, but that looks really clean considering it was pitch black out at night. Uh, well, you gotta be careful though. If you have like texture and clarity, if you try and increase those, in this case, it's actually doing a pretty good job there bringing out those textures in the rocks. But sometimes you'll get weird artifacts, especially with clarity. So I usually recommend leaving both of those off unless you know what you're doing. But in this case, I might actually uh, increase the texture by plus 10, just to give the rocks a little bit more of an edge. So those are our main adjustments there. We fix the white balance manually just by increasing the saturation first. The big thing really is getting the exposure bumped up so we can see the details in the foreground. And it's already looking pretty good. All right, now that we've gotten the main things done, let's go over to our lens correction tab. It's over here in the middle. I usually recommend turning on the chromatic aberration fix just by checking this button because very often you will find that there are little purple or green lines, especially around your horizon. I would probably see them most right over here with these stars. So there's before with no chromatic aberration fix and after. And then finally, we can try our profile corrections. See how much of an impact that has. Now the cool thing is if we come down here, we have distortion and vignette. See how when I increase the distortion to 100, which is like essentially fixing it. If I turn it back down to zero, it's making the center a little bit more round, which I like. So in this case, I'm actually gonna turn off the distortion correction just by moving the slider down to zero. And with the vignette slider, I might bring it up a little bit so there's not as much vignette, but I still want some. So maybe right around there. And I think that's looking like a really good starting point for our foreground. Now, once you've done all these adjustments, provided you use the same settings and the same lens and everything else, you could just come up to your tracked exposure with your star tracker hold down the control or command key and click on it. Now your foreground and your sky are selected. And then just right click on it, hit sync settings, and then hit okay. And when you do that, your sky should now pretty well match your foreground. In this case, it looks way too blue though. So I might increase the temperature a little bit and maybe even adjust the tint. So it's not always perfect, but at least get you a good starting point. And I think that's gonna look good. So once you've done your adjustments to your sky and your foreground, we wanna make sure we hit control or command and ensure that they're both selected now. And then I'm gonna actually hold down the shift key. And when I hold down the shift key, you'll see this changes from open images to open objects down here in the lower right. So we wanna make sure we open these both as objects. So again, hold down shift and then click open objects. When you do that, it should take you right over to Photoshop. And now we can start blending and make sure that both of these photos actually merge together properly. All right, now we have both photos loaded up. And what I need to do is get the sky exposure on top of the foreground. Now what some people might do is hit Control A, Control C. So it's gonna hit everything and copy it. Come over to here and hit Control or Command V to paste it. However, you don't want to do that because we're using smart objects today. And you'll notice that the foreground here has this little tiny document icon and the sky does not because I did the control C, control V option. So if you're used to doing that, you don't want to do it here. What you want to do is click on the move tool at the top left, it's the four way arrows, click and drag your image up to the top here to the other tab, drag it down and now let go of the mouse button and the photo will drop in then you can maneuver it wherever you want. Once you've done that, you should see the little document icon there and we know 
they're both smart objects now. That's really what I wanted you to do. So there we go. We have our sky on top of our foreground in terms of layer structure. Now, as we talk about in all of my post-processing courses, there's a very specific layer structure that we need to follow. We need foreground, sky, foreground, copy. So right now I want you to right click, duplicate layer on your foreground, and you just leave it named copy there and hit OK. And then if you click and drag this up till you see the blue line there, and then let go, we now have our proper layer structure. Again, foreground, sky in the middle, and then another foreground on the bottom. Now in this case, we have a very easy blend. <laughs> Thankfully, there's no trees or branches. So all I'm gonna do is use the quick selection tool here on the left, make sure I'm actually on my top layer, and I have the little plus button option selected. Then all I have to do is just click and drag over the sky, and it should pretty quickly snap and select it. Now in this case, it did a pretty good job, but you can see we missed some areas. So what I can do is now choose the minus button from the very top. You can also, I believe, hit Alt or Option. That will also change it. Uh, so do whatever you want. Either hold down the Alt or Option key or just click up here to change it to the minus. And then what we need to do is also change the size so it actually fits our horizon here. So I'm gonna hold down the Alt key and then click where it went too far and drag. And you can see there it went pretty easily. So I'm gonna scan across the image now, look for any more problem areas. I think that's actually Vermilion Cliffs back there. And I know there's a spot over here on the right. Yeah. So again, I'm gonna hold down the Alt or Option key. You'll see that plus changes to a minus if you have really good vision. And then just click and drag down below. And the later versions of Photoshop are really good with this algorithm, but if you're using an older version, you might have some more trouble with this. And in that case, I might even just leave some of that alone. So in this, in situations like this, when you're out in the desert, it's really not too hard to get a nice clean blend. But if you're like in the forest or something, you're gonna have a much more difficult time. And that's where we're gonna use Instamask from Raya Pro which does an amazing job. So if you're interested in learning how to blend really complicated scenes, you'll definitely want to check out my astrophotography post-processing course. There's over 10 hours at least of videos in there. One of the main focuses is how to blend tricky foregrounds and skies when using a star tracker. So once you make it through that course, you'll have no problem blending your own images. So be sure to check that out for more information. Uh, but today we have a very simple blend, thankfully. Now, once you've selected just the sky, we need to add a layer mask. So if you come down to the lower right, you're gonna see a little box with a square in the middle, or rather, excuse me, a little uh, box with a circle in the middle. And if you hover over it, it'll say add layer mask. So we'll click that button and there we go. Now in this case, it did the exact opposite of what I wanted it to do. It only allowed my sky to be visible and it hid my foreground. So if this happens to you and it kind of does the opposite of what you want, just hit Control or Command I to invert the layer mask. Once you do that, you'll now have the proper blend. All right, so we can see our sharp stars are now visible here. So if I click on my middle layer, I can drag this up until it matches as closely as possible. And again, this is where it helps to take both of your photos in roughly the, the same spot, especially in scenarios like this where there's no big abstractions. And I can even click the crop tool now over on the left, change it from original ratio just to ratio at the very top, clear out any presets it has just by clicking the clear button, and then drag it out manually. So now I can get a really nice square format photo. Maybe something like that. And then I'll hit OK. And we have kind of a little problem here with our layer mask again. So you can see if I hold down the Alt or Option key and click, there's this line here. So if I want to, I can just use a black paintbrush and just tag that real quick. So if you're still new to layer masks, what I did, this is really important to know, if you hold down the Alt or Option key and click on your layer mask, you can instantly view it. Anything that's black will be turned off for the layer that it's applying to. Anything that's white will be visible for the layer next to it. So in this case, it's white down here with the foreground, 
which is why we see the foreground, and it's black up top, which is why we see the sky layer from down below. Now, this is something you're going to encounter a lot, where the image just looks really fake right now. And that's because our sky is just too dark. It needs to be at least as bright as some of these background areas. Or, alternatively, our foreground is too bright and it needs to be darker. So you really have two options at this point, depending on which route you want to go down. I think I'm going to probably start with the foreground, though, because it is pretty bright. So what you can do, since we use smart objects, is just double click on the layer itself. You want to make sure you click the little thumbnail here. When you double click on it, it's going to bring you right back to camera raw. And this is really powerful because now we can go right back to the source image and edit it as needed. So in this case, back here, it's just too bright. So I'm going to start by lowering the exposure a little bit. Maybe bring up the shadows more because the shadows really aren't targeting this area. They're targeting here. So I can really just target things a lot better now with the shadows, it looks like. I might also want to bring down the highlights a little bit because see how that's really targeting up here. So if I bring those down, once you think you have it good, just hit OK. It's going to go through, it's going to apply all those edits in real time, and there we go. That looks a little bit better than it did before. So there's our before. See how it's just way too bright on the horizon there and after. That looks much more natural, but it's still not great. So with that in mind, I'm going to double click now on my sky layer. And when I do that, I might want to make things a little bit brighter. So I'll bring up the highlights some. I'll bring up the whites even and the exposure. And then I'll hit OK. And it's starting to look much more natural now. So you can see by using those smart objects, we can very easily go back and forth and get things blending much more naturally. If you did this the old-fashioned way, it would just be a lot more difficult. So this is really helpful. And at this point, I think we're off to a good start. But again, my biggest problem is just this horizon is kind of too dark. And over here, it's too bright. So I could even hold down the Alt or Option key, click on my layer mask, and I can see what we're looking at. And I can say, you know what, let's try and bring it in a little bit. So if I click on my layer mask again, so it's selected, I'm going to take a black paintbrush. And then I can just paint out where I don't want it. Now you got to be careful here, because in this case, my hardness is like 9%. So it's going to look kind of fuzzy on the horizon there. So what I can do is increase the hardness a little bit and bring down the size. And you want to make sure you're actually on your layer mask when you're doing this, not the layer itself. And then we can try to paint it out again. This is just kind of a freehand way to do it. There's a lot better ways to do it as well. But in this case, it should work just fine. Okay, so there's our before and after. Most people probably didn't even see that, but it's pretty noticeable. There's that little blue area is gone now. And then really the last thing we have to do is worry about over here. Again, what I could do is just paint out some of these trouble areas freehand, like that. And then I can even target just this area. So for example, let's say I just want it to be maybe a little less saturated, or maybe less blues, I can maybe add a vibrance layer up top here and lower the vibrance to maybe minus 20. Then I'll hit Control or Command I. That will make this layer black, or the layer mask. I've essentially turned off the layer now. Then I can use a white paintbrush and just paint it in exactly where I want it, like so. And that might help. Just take some of that blue out of the sky or the rocks there. So I think that's looking pretty good. And, you know, it's never going to look perfect, especially if your camera settings weren't exactly the same and the night sky changed a little bit between your photos. So 
just make sure you don't notice any glaring problems or, along the horizon. And then also you'll want to do one more check and move your sky layer around and just make sure it matches up. And I think that's going to do just fine. Now we're ready to do our general adjustments. So at this point, you really want to make sure that everything is blending as good as you can get it. If things still look kind of weird, spend some more time adjusting things. But from here, I think I'm just going to add a curves layer over the entire image. Now there's a really cool tool here with the curves once you've added it. If you click on the hand tool, you can specify specific portions of your photo. For example, if I think these rocks here should be a little bit darker, I can click, drag my mouse downward, and now it's putting a point on the corresponding histogram here. And then if I say, you know what, this area up here should be a little bit brighter, I can click and drag that up. So now I've just added a very customized curve to the image. And that adds just a nice little bit of contrast and helps the image out quite a bit, I think. Next, I think the overall image is just too long up top. So I'm going to go back to my crop tool, put it to a one by one ratio, and then crop out some of that extra. And I still think it's a little bit too top heavy, but we'll go with it for now. All right. So at this point, we've done our blending quite nicely. We've done a little bit of curves and you have so much freedom at this point. This is where if you get the Astro Photography post-processing course or any of the Star Tracker courses, I go into this a bunch of different ways because I've got so many different workflows. So it's really up to you to experiment and figure out what works best for your images. I'll just go through a basic one today though just to give you guys an idea. So the first thing you want to do at this stage if you're ready to apply a filter, for example, and I want to caution you, at this point we are going to start being destructive. In other words, if we make or if we notice any problems down the road, we'll have to come all the way back to this spot and start over essentially. So bear that in mind. Uh, but we're going to do Control, Shift, Alt, and E. That's going to create a new layer. If you're on Mac, that's Command, Shift, Option, E. And I know everybody always freaks out every time I say that. Um, they get all weirded out by it, but it's really not a hard combination to remember, especially when you've watched my videos a thousand times. <laughs> so Control, Shift, Alt, E, or Command, Shift, Option, E. If you did it correctly, it's going to create a new layer. This layer is essentially everything below it combined into one. That way we can effectively apply some filters. And in this case, we're gonna use the Google Nick collection. Well, it used to be from Google. Now DxO bought them out and they're charging quite a bit for it. So uh, if you have it, you can check it out. If not, uh, I mean, it's kind of expensive, but especially if you're doing deep space astrophotography, I would say it's worth it. As you'll see in my Deep Space course, we use this software quite a bit. But for Milky Way photography, it's not necessarily as essential. And one of my favorite filters in here is Film Effects Modern, which you can see right here. The way this works is there's all these different film profiles that you can select, and they're all going to drastically change the look of the photo. And I usually just scroll through these one by one and see what looks good for the particular image, like. I kind of really like the way that affects the sky. You can actually see the Milky Way really nicely there compared to, I guess you actually see it pretty well by default. Uh, but it's just kind of fun to go through all these and see how they affect your photo and which ones you actually like. So today I might go with, maybe we'll do this one today. And we can always tweak it later. So once you've selected the photo you think is going to work best, if you click Film Details, you can come in here and there's sensitivity and saturation. Sensitivity, as you can probably imagine, is going to make the colors brighter or darker. Usually, though, I leave these at their defaults unless I really need to adjust them for a specific reason. And you want to be careful. Like yellow is probably going to target the cliffs there. And it's just easy to go too far here and screw up the photo. So it's best to do these adjustments slowly, if you will. Once you've gotten the sensitivity looking good, 
you can even adjust the saturation. So if I want to have some more cyan in the photo, which looks like it's mainly the river down there, I can really bring this up. And then I can adjust the blues as well as the violets. The greens and yellows aren't really going to do too much. The last thing I want to warn you about is that there's a grain slider down here, grain per pixel. Make sure this is at 500. Otherwise, if you look down here, you can see you're adding grain to the photo if it's anything other than 500. So make sure you always uh, remember to do that. Now, I think that looks pretty cool. I'm not a huge fan of it, but we can make it work. So if you're happy with that, you can hit OK. It's going to apply the filter. Or if you want to add another one, you can hit Add Filter down here at the very bottom. If you forget to hit Add Filter, it's just going to wipe out the filter you just did if you click another one. So make sure you hit the Add Filter button before you click on another filter here. And today I'll maybe try Sunlight. That's almost like an Orton effect, which I tend to like in my photos. And you can adjust the light strength or the temperature. So this is a fun one to mess around with. And in this case, I might even just do this one separately, just so I don't go too overboard with one filter. So I'm just going to hit OK for now. I've turned off the sunlight because I don't want that one for right now. And now it's going to go through and apply that fil uh, the filter to the photo. Now overall I like how it affected the sky especially, but I think it went too heavy on the foreground. See how it just kind of like crushed it? So I could even take our layer mask from earlier and apply it right to here or just do it manually again. So for example, if I use the quick selection tool, just click over the sky, it did a pretty good job. I can hold down the Alt or Option key, click and drag over my foreground again, so I don't select it. And again, it's pretty easy in this particular case. And then hit the Add Layer Mask button. And now when we do before and after, it's only targeting the sky. And I really like that. I don't really necessarily need it to apply to the foreground. Uh, but moving on, I can even add another curves from up here. And if you don't have this adjustments, if you come up to window and choose adjustments, that should make it pop up on the screen somewhere. And then you can always drag these things around and move them the way you want. Uh, just so you know that if you're not sure. But we'll go back, we'll hit our curves tool. I'm gonna use the hand icon here again. I'm gonna add some contrast just to the foreground, I think. So if I want this rock here to be a little bit brighter, I can click and drag up and then click and drag down over here. If I don't want this to apply to the sky though, because the sky is getting too bright, I can take our layer mask that we already have down here, hold down the Alt or Option key, click with our mouse, drag it up while we're holding down Alt or Option, and then let go of the mouse. If you did everything right, you should now have the exact same layer mask. Of course, this is not what we want though, we want the opposite. So you can just hit Invert up top here, or Control or Command I. And there we go. So again, that was just holding down the Alt or Option key, clicking and dragging it up to replace it, and then in this case I had to invert it. And I really like the way that affected the foreground, but it's also screwing up that darn horizon way here in the background. See that? So if I want, I can take my black paintbrush and just turn this off over that area as well, because I think it's making it way too bright. So again, just to give you an idea of what I'm doing, I'm just putting black here on my layer mask, and that's translating to this actual curve here. It's turning it off, the effect that we just did, like so. And this is honestly one of the trickier uh, backgrounds I've ever had to deal with, just because it's unusually bright back there. Yeah, I think it looks better now. And that's really, Something that you'll learn a lot more if you get my courses is just that every photo is unique. It has its own little problems you have to deal with. And the more little tricks and tips that you learn about Photoshop, the easier it gets to deal with them. Because if you're a complete beginner, even if you spend a lot of hours in Photoshop, some of these weird little problems, if you're not used to dealing with them, can drive you crazy. So that's something that we really touch on in my Astro Post Processing course. But moving on, I think the image looks pretty cool at this point. 
the foreground has a lot of nice contrast, the sky as well. So honestly, I'm pretty happy with that overall. And I don't want this to drag on too long. So I'm gonna try probably two more effects and then we might call it for this video. And both of those are gonna involve Raya Pro. Now, you might have seen one of my videos before talking about this. This is a piece of software from Jimmy McIntyre. He has, I think it's Raya Pro version four is the latest version. So if you type that in, you'll find it. But this is some of the best software you can get for Photoshop. And I'm not sponsored in any way. I just really like Jimmy. He's got really great tutorials on YouTube. And uh, these plugins have really just made my life so much easier, especially with blending with trackers. It's just amazing how well it works. Anyway, though, if you get Raya Pro, there's this filters and actions tab. And I use the big vignette very often, as well as magic green lands. There's also uh, Orton effects that are real nice to have. There's just so many different tools in here, but I'm gonna try Magic Green Lands and we'll see what that does. So when this window pops up, I'm just gonna click OK. That's the Orton effect that it's applying. And there's the effect applied to the image. It's way too strong, but the great thing is there's a little folder here with all of the different things he did. And I can go in here one by one, turn it on and off and see how it affects the image. If I don't like it, I'll just turn off the eyeball. Then I'll go down to the next one and then the next one, and then the next one. And one of the things I really like about this filter is that it has this Orton effect. And watch what that does to your horizon. So see here, before the Orton effect, it's very harsh along the edge. Then after the Orton effect, it smooths it out and the light bleeds over in the foreground and it makes it look a lot more natural. So this is one of the best little tips I can give you in this whole video is that if you want to really have a nice, natural, soft light on the horizon, an Orton effect is the way to go. And with Raya Pro, he makes it really easy to do that. Trying to do it manually is a pain in the butt. Now what you can do from here is lower the opacity if you think it's too strong. You can do that for any of these. So if I lower it to maybe, you know, 60%, that should be good. And then I'll continue on down, turn off the greens, the mid-tones kick, it's a little strong. So I'm gonna lower that. And then finally we have contrast. It looks good, but maybe a little less. Once I've gone through each individual uh, portion by itself, I'll collapse the group, or rather put it back to its state. Do a before and after the entire filter. And you can see what that does. It draws our eye to this area, adds a nice soft glow, a slight vignette. And that looks pretty good to me. Now we are noticing one problem and this is you know, one of the problems with that destructive workflow I mentioned, if you remember that, where I said, if we notice a problem later on the workflow, we're gonna have to go all the way back to when we hit Control Shift Alt E to fix it. The problem I'm noticing is that there's some vignette here in the sky. So that could be a problem. Let me show you what I mean. So if I turn off these layers we did, if I double click on my sky layer, we're going right back to the start now. Say we still have some of the little vignette there. What I probably should have done right out of the gate was put the vignetting amount to 100 rather than lowering it. That way the sky is naturally bright down there at the bottom. And let's see how that affects things. Look right over here. See how much brighter that is? That looks a lot more natural too. So that's something I should have caught. But again, this is the thing about photo editing is that there's all these little things and you might not notice until you've added three or four contrast adjustments or curves. So the problem we have now, if I want to keep that in, I can no longer use the film effects or the magic green lands because that is baked in with that earlier adjustment, which is a shame. So at this point you have two options really. What I can do is delete magic green lands and film effects and just redo them, or I can try another workaround. And since I don't want to waste your time, I think I'll just try the workaround today. But now you know some of the problems you might encounter. So in order to fix this, what I'm going to do is probably come down here to the film effects since that's like the base of these. I'll use my dodge tool here from the left menu. You have to click and hold sometimes to find it. But if we click on the dodge tool, I'm going to choose highlights, fairly big brush, and I'm just going to brighten up the edge here. 
This is a very easy way to do things rather than starting all over essentially. I can even just target the shadows from the drop down menu at the top. So again, we have shadows, midtones, and highlights. And this is going to target just the dark areas. And I always recommend if you're going to do that, you do before and after. That way you can tell if it looks kind of weird. I don't think it looks too weird though. Uh, but you might want to just go back and redo it if you weren't sure. So I'm going to click on my layer again. And then we'll try that dodging. And the problem I have here is I went too far down. I was on the wrong layer. That can happen to you as well. Uh, because we have so many layers here, sometimes you just lose track and you wonder why things don't work. So if you're ever confused about that, just make sure you're actually on the correct layer. In that case, I was not. I wanted to be up here. So now we can go back, redo our dodging, just because I don't think it looked as good as it could have. And as I mentioned, you always want to use a very low exposure here because it goes really quickly. And if you're not careful, it might look kind of weird. So that looks better there. And then we'll hit over here as well. It's really noticeable there. And every time I click and drag, it's going to make it a little bit brighter. And in that case, it probably doesn't look too good over there. So anyway, there's our before and after. I think it looks better. Again, the best way to do things would be to just delete these layers and redo them with the updated base image. But I just want to show you a quick workaround. So I'm pretty happy with that. The final thing I'm going to do is add a global vignette to the image. So I'm darkening all the corners. For that, the easiest way is to use Raya Pro. Click Big Vignette. And there we go. And that looks great. I can always lower the opacity, though, if I think it's too strong. And I can even add a layer mask and say, you know what? I don't want you targeting the sky as much or the foreground as much and just paint it out. But in this case, I really like it. And in fact, I might even do one last little trick for you guys. If I add a brightness, which is right here, little sun icon, I can just increase the brightness a little bit. Maybe bring down the contrast a tad. And then from here, I'm going to hit Control or Command I on my layer mask. That's going to make it black. I'll take a white paintbrush. And I want to target this area mainly. So I'm just going to paint this in. Like that. There we go. And then I'll go to Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur. This is one of my most used tools throughout the various courses. And if I zoom out now, this is our layer mask we're looking at. This is what it looks like by default. It's very defined lines. I just want to blur it out so you can't even tell I did that. Something like that. Then I'll hit OK. And now if we do before and after, see how there's just a subtle brightness boost to the center of the frame just to get your eye there before it's kind of too dark. And there we go. I think that's a finished image at that point. I'm really happy with that. Let's just get a quick idea though of how that looked compared to the original. There's the original. I almost kind of like our new version better. More purple. Uh, but you know that's a really fun image to do. And that's pretty much all I have for you today. So like I said, if you're interested in learning more about astrophotography, like how to actually take these photos, I do have my various Star Trek or courses. If you buy any of those, you're going to get the astrophotography post-processing course included. So be sure to check those out over on my website. Or if you want to join me for an actual workshop, again, my 2020 schedule is now live. I'm going to be doing pretty much at least one workshop per month throughout the whole year. I might even add a second workshop per month if all these sell out, but that's up to you guys. Uh, so that's all I have for you in today's video. I hope you learned a little bit more about Photoshop and you see what's possible. And if you have any questions, leave a comment. Thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you either in the videos or out in person in 2020.